Here we go. Okay, 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 everybody. I see some folks are joining us already. We apologize for being a couple of minutes behind, but let me tell you, it's going to be worth waiting for. Welcome again to the Black Book Expo, a conscious literary festival. We have been in a festival in festivities in a literary way the whole month of February with Arthur Chats on Facebook Live every Tuesday, Wednesday evening. We started out with um, Dr. Malefi Kete Asante. Then we talked to the president of the University of Richmond, Dr. Ronald Crutcher, two passionate educators and authors. Those chats are still available right here on this platform. Then we uh, spent some time with Chief Oluwo Obafemi Fayemi uh, and uh, authors and um, I'll call them explorers, uh, Tony Browder and his daughter Atlantis. Last night, we went to uh, Wida in Benin and spent some time with Her Majesty, Queen Mother Dewoti Desir. And tonight, to wrap it up and bring it full circle, we are here with Professor Kaba Kamine. I know y'all been waiting on this one. I know you have. Hey, Imani Bay, we're happy to have you back tonight. I know you've been waiting on this one and I promise you it will not disappoint. And also keep in mind for those of you who are in striking distance, come on out to the Cultural Center uh, in downtown Richmond in the RVA Arts District this weekend for books, books, books of all genres on the table. We're getting the online store set up, so don't you worry. Um, we will ship it to your doorstep. Uh, we'll have independent authors talking this weekend as well. We start uh, live streaming at four o'clock on this very same place. Saturday and also on day. So it's just been lovely and it's been lovely because of you. So we thank you so much for the interest that you have been showing in the Black Book Expo, a conscious literary festival. So tonight, Professor Kaba Kamine, please join me in welcoming him. He is an author, of course, a cultural education consultant, a curriculum writer, an educator at heart too, and quite passionate, a staple hidden colors scholar, and a respected documentarian. He is a consultant to academics and academic institutions. Uh, Professor Cabernet is an international studies and world history specialist. He is firmly dedicated to the belief that culture plays a vitally important role in education and proudly credits many of his academic views to his master teacher, Dr. John Henry Clark. He developed and directs the African-Centered Science Academy per UNC, 
or the temple of life. Welcome, 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 Kaba Ka Hiawatha Kabine. Hotep and peace to my sister, Alafia, to the family. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I, I really have been looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, thank you so much. And we are here tonight to, I mean, listen, with you here, we could talk about so many things for a long time. But our focus tonight is going to be your book, Spirituality Before Religions. Spirituality Before Religions. Spirituality is unseen science and science is seen spirituality. So now just in thinking about that, there's something that you said um, in reference to this book. You said there are two laws of cosmic spirituality. The first law, love and respect the creator within you. Mm. No, you are the creator having a human experience. Then the second law, if that's not enough, because I just get filled all up saying those words out loud. Then the second law, love and respect the creator in nature the same way you love the creator within yourself. That is privilege and responsibility at once. That is gift at once. Um, break some of this down for us. It's, it's very simple. It's a cosmic law. It, it goes beyond the earth. It's ma'at, it's balance and, and harmony. Uh, it's, it's more than just what we see. Uh, we here on earth, you know, there's, a, there's organizations created simply to make you not believe that. And what we as a people have to do is break it down for me, very simple. Um, I've, I've always admired uh, many of our, our heroes and sheroes, particularly Harriet Tubman and Malcolm X. And Malcolm used to always say, make it plain. And as an educator, I've always tried to take complex and make it simple. And I found that when you are having difficulty in a classroom, no matter what the subject may be, there's a very good chance that what they've done is taking the simple and made it complex. Because to the human mind, we should not have problems understanding cosmic law. The bottom line is, is that in all of the holy books, no matter where you may um, uh, see them or have them, no matter what religion you are, they all say the same thing. They all say that we are the, in the image of the creator. But at the same time, they'll have you chasing concepts of the creator outside of yourself. You have to go to church or you have to go to temple or you have to go to mosque or you have to go to a, a synagogue or you have to go to a temple in order to find God. You know, I grew up Roman Catholic, my sister, hmm. and very strict, uh, um, altar boy, choir boy, all Ooh. of them. Even <laughs> want to be a priest. <laughs> oh. Uh, but one of the things, but see, as a young, young African man growing up during the 50s and 60s and 70s, there were questions that I had that just weren't being answered. And I remember um, one, one of the things is that there is a habit that you do. It's a tradition that when you pass the middle of the church, you turn around, you face it, and you genuflect. You get on one knee, and then you get back up, OK? When you're leaving the church, let's say you're at Sunday service and you're leaving service. Before you leave the building, you must turn back around and you must genuflect again. We were taught that the image was that you were leaving the house of God. And so you were paying respect to God as you were leaving. And in my mind, I always said, but once I leave this house, isn't God coming with me? Like, is, isn't God in the street? You know, isn't God in my house? 
you so so i had a search for god i had a search for this creator and the thing is is that there there are so many different ways that organizations are created to instill fear in people to understand that their greatest accomplishments will come only through them speaking to the creator and what i am saying is that you don't need any middle person to get to the creator all you have to do is be who you are. You are the creator. You are the image of the creator, be you male or female, because that's another thing my head couldn't get around. Because everybody was telling me how many women were in the world, more than men. Everybody was telling me one of the things got me in trouble was when I asked um, the nun, because I went to Catholic school, mm -hmm. I asked, is, is God that great? And she said, yeah, God is great. I said, but is God really great? And she said, God is the greatest. I said, but how can God be the greatest? Wouldn't the mother of God be greater than him? Uh-oh. That you, got me in trouble. You created problems. Very, very much. But that's in the mind of a child. Yeah, of course. I need to understand this because you're telling me that God is great or the greatest, but wouldn't the person that brought him into the world be greater than him? And would she not ex have existed before him? <laughs> yes. Now that's just common sense to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this has been my journey. This book, Spirituality Before Religions, is the culmination of the journey. I did not write this book because I'm a writer, because I really am a teacher. I'd rather be teaching. I write because I have something to say. I don't Indeed. write because I'm a writer. Indeed. And if I write a book, it's because I'm trying to say something and not just because I'm trying uh, to fulfill my writing skills. And so spirituality before religions was a, a, a journey that about six or seven years ago, I came to realize that this wasn't my personal journey. I felt that I needed to share what I had found out with our community and those that were willing to listen and to understand. Because the second cosmic law says that if you love yourself, realizing that you are the creator, having a human experience, then it must also be demanded of us to love the creator's creations as we love the creator him herself you can't love yourself and despise outside that's a different type of feeling and the only way you can know how to love outside of yourself is to love the inside of yourself these are cosmic laws these are laws of the cosmos these are laws that guide nature on earth the same laws that guide us as humans through nature, it guides nature and it allows nature to fulfill her, his destiny. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I focus on that. Even in my book, you'll see that I'm always do, doing that his slash her, her slash his, him, her, because I want to get us thinking another type of way. I want us to get away from the fact that you could ever imagine a one gender creator. That is so dangerous to me. That is so self-defeating. Because by the nature of my existence, I am half a man and half a woman. Because I have a mother and I'm half a her. It just so happened that my daddy's Y DNA chromosome was given to my mother and my X and his X chromosome was given to my mother to present my sister to the world five years before me. But all of us are both half man and half woman. And so there's no way that I could ever perceive of anything unigender. Goes against science. Forget the personal. That goes against science. So how, how you started off by saying it's a very simple con concept, but how do we get it so wrong? We seem to be way disconnected from this simplicity that holds so much power. 
absolutely. And, and I can understand why, because the dominant culture don't want you to understand the truth. Hmm. Those that lead and control and contain and dominate don't want you to know because they have built religious systems where they and how they look create the God concept. So now another step, if Africa, the center of the world is the birthplace of humanity and in birthing humanity from spirit and, the, and this cosmic reality that we're discussing into the physical, then Africa must hold within her the origins of spirituality. So if this is true, could you define spirituality and divinity in an African context? Well, let me put it to you in a cosmic context because okay. it was the cosmic context, uh, context that was given to Africans. Nature was our first teacher. And the first family, the first human beings are people we today call the Twa Mbuti. They're called Moesha. They are called many things. And one derogatory term that the original family is called is pygmy. Mm. They are the original. They were the ones that sat at the feet of nature and nature taught them these realities. And because of the teachings that nature gave them, they went from being a hunter gatherer society to an agricultural society, to a technological society. They then gave birth to who we call the Kush. And then they gave birth to the people that we call the Kemites. And spirituality before religions in chapter five was meant to examine the texts, the Memphite theology, the pyramid text, the coffin text, the book of the coming forth today with the judgment scene, the Shabaka stone. My approach was to show every religion without mentioning a religion, because ain't no religions mentioned. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get nobody's back up, not trying to get the hairs up because people get very personal and very sensitive when it comes to these types of conversations. Indeed, indeed. But just my analysis of the text themselves can show you where you got your scripture from, just by nature of the pyramid text. You can go in there and look on the walls and you'll see in the utterances, because they call them utterances. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the utterances in 276, 277, where they, where the Neset Biti or the Pharaoh, the divine human has transitioned and he is now ascending into heaven. He is now going through his movement after transition, after he's died, he's moving in. But carved on these walls of the pyramid texts of the last Pharaoh of the fifth dynasty, Unas, it, it's described how he's eating the body of the gods and drinking the blood of the gods. Hmm. Hmm. Sounds it's a familiar. Metaphor. It's very familiar, but it's a metaphor. It was never meant to be taken seriously as if it actually happened. The bottom metaphor to what they're explaining is that if you eat of the divine, you become divine. It's a metaphor. It's an image. It's an analogy, an allegory. It was never meant to be taken serious like somebody's blood and body was being eaten because that's cannibalistic vampirism to me. <laughs> and so when these laws were given to us, what they were actually saying is that when you take in your life those things that are divine, you become a divine human worthy of being able to go into what we call heaven. They called it amenta. Amen is hidden. Ta means land, the hidden land, which it was heaven. And if you didn't, and if you lived uh, uh, not a very appropriate life, then you were thrown into the scalding water that was called the lake of fire hmm. that was protected by four baboons on each side. Hmm. And the idea was that's where you got the idea of hell. Everything is water. Everything comes out of the nun. Everything 
in the, in the universe and science is based on hydrogen, hydrogen plasma. So it wasn't a fire hell with oxygen. It was a fire hell in water. It was, and that's where you, that was the hell that you would be uh, sent to, the scalding waters of the lake of fire. And so now we have images of a hell, hell fire. We image that it might be dry. But the idea to our ancestors was you return back into the waters from whence you came. And so when you begin to look at the metaphor and the stories that our ancestors told us, Africa is the center because in science, the other thing is, again, the, the spirituality before religions tells another story about the water and the hill that rises up out of the water. Well, John G. Jackson, in his book, Introduction to African Civilization, mm -hmm. does a masterful job of explaining how our earth came into existence. And it came into existence between a battle between the, the volcanoes and the earthquakes from the core of the earth that was rising through the waters, but then the waters would take them over and bring them back down. And then there'd be more geological eruptions and the land would come back up and then the water would take over. John G. Jackson says it happened about five. It could have happened more or less times. But whatever it is, the story is, is that this hill that came up out of the water came up and stayed up over the water. The water didn't overcome it. It became a hill. We in science call it Pangea. Our ancestors called it Pata. But mm -hmm. on the very tip top of that hill mm -hmm. is the continent of Africa. Mm. I'm talking science now. I'm not, this is why they, they, you cannot really have an effective earthquake in Africa because Africa sits on its own plate. Uh huh. Plate tectonics says that what creates an earthquake is a shifting of the Earth's plates. Yes. But Africa doesn't sit on multiple plates. It only sits on one plate. It's at the top of the hill. So it is that top of the hill that received most of the raw light or sunlight over billions of years that would bring life forward. And the center of that center is the Great Lakes region, which is at the equator, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Congo, and parts of Southern Africa. Okay. So that is why you see a plethora. You, you see a richness of animals, lions. You have animals there that you have no place else on the planet. If you see a gorilla, you know that gorilla came from Africa. If you see a lion, wherever you see the lion, you can see a, a, a lion in Iran. If you see it in Iran, you know that lion came from Africa. Zebra from Africa. Even the wild dog is from Africa. So that the flora, the flowers, the minerals, all are in Africa. Why? Because the sun, light, heat, and sound energy was on that part of the, and I'm talking about before human beings were on the planet. The sunlight enriched the earth of Africa and created the flora and the fauna that later would bring forward life out of the waters onto the land, amphibian, then stayed on the land, became reptile. Reptile became mammal. Mammal came, you know, the original mammal where we came from as human beings, it's called hadraconia. It's about the size of the top of your pinky finger. Hmm. Hadraconium. I'm talking science now. And out of this hadraconium came a development of the mammalian uh, system that would give birth to us as human beings in the Great Lakes region. And we would go through six formations from Australopithecus robustus, Australopithecus gracile, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens sapiens. The original Homo sapiens sapiens, the only ones that existed on the planet, and the only ones that exist on the planet right now, although we are the descendants of them, are the Twa Mbuti people, the short statured people from three foot eight to about their towering giants of five feet. So the center of the center is where the concentration of evolution occurred. Now you talk about evolution, but you also talk about involution. Mm -hmm. 
What's the difference? The difference is the idea that for the creator to come to his, her greatest point, spirit can't know spirit because it's a pure energy force. But when you concretize energy, which is spirit, because that you asked me, what is spirit? Spirit is energy. Spirit is movement. Like right now, right, right, right now, here's matter. My arm is matter. But what's making me move it? You can't see it. That's energy. Mm -hmm. You don't have to ask me what it is. You, you know what it is because my hand wouldn't be moving if it wasn't energy. But energy is moving matter. This is why I encourage us to study, my sister, study science. Mm -hmm. because, because chemistry answers the question, what is matter? Mm -hmm. Physics answers the question, what makes matter move? What makes matter move was the actual coming into existence of the creator in the cosmic universe. And so as you're moving through this process, evolution takes us through a life history. And this life history starts with light, heat, and sound energy coming down from the heavens. Now, our ancestors told this story in Shabaka Stone, where they talked about the fact that Nut and Geb were in a lover's embrace. They were procreating. And Shu, air, came down and separated Nut, who was sky, from Geb, the earth. Hmm. And that is when it allowed the uh, Nut swallowing the sun and giving birth to it in the day. So that started the cycle of night and day, but it also started the cycle of life because we know about the ozone layer. Mm -hmm. And we know that when there was a time on the earth where the earth was hovered over, that did not allow light and heat energy to come through. Part of it was called the Carboniferous Age. See, spirituality is unseen science and science has seen spirituality. And our ancestors understood this and they made it very natural. They made it very simple. They made it all part of life. And so when air rose up and made the sky come up, that's what allowed the light and heat energy to come through and bring life on the planet. Our ancestors spoke in metaphor. They used figurative language. They used personification. They used metaphor and simile. They used symbols to understand the world around them. And so it had to go through a stage. We started with what's called archaea, started with bacteria in the waters. And then it started to go into what we might call the other forms of life that would bring the, the botany and uh, the fish. And then from the fish would come the amphibian. From the amphibian would come the reptile. We are all part of that evolution. And I know that when you're deeply steeped in religion, you have an image of a God creating a man from clay, according to the Abrahamic religions. And then you have the idea of God putting this man to sleep and taking out his rib and creating women. Now, family, with due respect to everybody, I'm sorry, I can't handle that story. It, it just fundamentally, my, my neurons don't connect to make sense. It don't make sense the same way when I was seven years old and I asked if God is great, is God's mother greater than him? That's the kind of sense it doesn't make to me anymore. And so I, I can't get with that story. So I have to look at a story that shows me from a, a scientific, which means knowledge. Science mm -hmm. means scient, which means knowledge. It just doesn't mean like biology and chemistry. Science is all knowledge. And so when I can see the transformation of organic life 
from the waters to the earth. And then on earth, it starts to form and it creates what we call, what we might call the primates. And then from the primates, you have two different distinctions because something's gonna happen a couple million years ago that's gonna make some of those primates come down on the grassland and start to live down there. They're gonna come out the tree and they're gonna come down on the land. There are gonna be others that are gonna remain up in the trees. The ones that remain in the trees, we call the pungits. The ones that came down on the ground, we call them the hominids. That's where the human family is gonna come out of, hominids. Because walking on the earth makes you live a different type of life than if you're in a tree. The Definitely. foods that you eat, chances are gonna be in a tree. The mm -hmm. foods you eat down on the ground are gonna be down on the ground. And then that's gonna bring other things into existence that you have to understand and know to be able to live. So that's gonna start hunter gatherers. That's gonna start the agriculture and on down the road. But then going through those six phases of the human family, ending up with homo sapiens sapiens, what's gonna happen is that the brain is gonna get the right size. The lungs are gonna get the right size, gonna be able to breathe. The circulatory system is gonna to get to the right size. The fluids will run through your body. Your pineal gland is gonna be activated. Your, your, your forehead is going to start to move forward and come out. That's going to allow your limbic system to settle itself. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a lot of brain anatomy in this and also nervous system changes are going to occur. And then all of a sudden, that human being is going to reflect on him or herself. That starts involution which is the search for the creator within. within. But the body had to get to the right size. The brain had to get to the right thinking capacity in order for this to happen. We pretty much are where we are as a human family right now in terms of our size. In terms of the way our lungs look, they're pretty much gonna stay the way they are. Circulatory system, not much is gonna change as it relates to our physicalness. But now here comes the search the involution where you're now going in to fulfill the creator's first desire. I want to know myself. And the only way I can know myself is to codify my energy inside of the matter in which I exist, which they call the nun, the waters of eternal immortality. <laughs> So you have certainly made the case and made it clear about the interwoven nature of spirit and nature, the holistic way of everything seen and unseen. Now you cite in the book, um, Shek Antajop, mm. the great Senegalese scholar, Dr. Jop, and he emphasizes a role for culture um, in increasing not only our understanding, but also this pursuit that you, that you mentioned. Talk about this a little bit. Dr. Sheikh Antadia, brilliant mind and very good friend to uh, Dr. John Henry Clark. I remember Dr. Clark telling stories about when he first met him in, in uh, Africa. Um, Uh, culture, Dr. Wade Nobles, brilliant scholar, once told us that culture is to a human as water is to a fish. Dr. Diop's friend, colleague, and also could be considered student, Dr. Theophali Obenga, he says that there is such a thing as an African cultural common sense. Culture is a cornerstone to us understanding. And the, 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 you know, there, there is, there's evidence of this. Hip hop is an evidence of this. Uh, when I uh, visited Richmond, Virginia, when you invited me to come and to do the program uh, in 2019 that was ushering in this 400 year premonition, you're, do, you, do you remember that my sister? Absolutely. And do you remember, think of where we were that day. Just think of where we were that day. 
the dancing, the festivities, and think of where we are now. Look at the change, the difference in the world today than when we were together not too long ago. Not too long ago. And all of it is because of nature. Nature has brought this into existence. We talked about this a little bit at the Kwanzaa Festival as well uh, in terms of nature's power in manifesting, um, I, I don't wanna say life choices, but in manifesting life circumstance or in manifesting ways that we have to, well, nature, nature um, invites us to open our eyes and see or to realize the, the power of choice that we have in our hands, to uh, consider the involution. It invites us to consider the involution because what did we do? We came in the house and sat down. And, um, and it gave us time and is giving us time to maybe reset our own balance. Absolutely. Nature loves us, but nature doesn't take sides. Nature takes its own side. That's right. And just as we are the image, science is the study of nature. Nature is the essence of the creator. And just as we are in the image of the creator, so too does nature reflect us. This virus is us. Nature is showing us what we as a human family have done over the past 5,000 years. We can go 400 if you wanna be exact. Nature is looking at us now and saying, this is why all of this thing about European domination, and I, I tend not to want to use the oxymoronic term white supremacy, because there's nothing supreme about white, but that concept. Nature is showing us, I brought you in, I brought you on this planet, but I didn't bring you here to act like this. Hmm. And just like I brought you in, I can take you out. Hmm. That's, that sounds like any black mama. That's exactly, that's the, that is the black cosmic mother talking to us. Okay. <laughs> this is the black cosmic mother talking to us. We are in the age of the black cosmic mother's return. This yeah. is she that is coming back. And, and this is not the earth mother. You, you, know, you know, like when I told the story about the virus, I, in the beginning, around, you know, last April, May, once I started looking at what was going on, I said, let me create a little metaphor to tell this story. And when it came to this virus, I told the story of, you know, when, when your grandmother's coming in to visit you and mother's trying to get the house together and all the kids are acting up. Right, right. And, and you know, my mother's saying, you know, y'all need to get yourselves together now. You're messing up. <laughs> get yourself together. You stop fighting each other. Stop <laughs> doing this to each other because I'm trying to get things ready because my mother's coming. And when my mother comes, I've got to account for what this house is. Mm -hmm. And the kids keep acting up, keep acting up. Mama say, don't make me get up out my chair now. <laughs> kids keep, keep acting up, mother gets up out the chair and says, all of y'all go into your rooms. This virus, with all of the so-called dominant threats, all this great nuclear power and bombs and uh, uh, assassinations, with all that they have, Mother Nature within a matter of a month had humanity in their rooms, scared to come outside. Yeah. And nature, Mother Nature said, you don't come out until I tell you you can come out. Don't tell me about no vaccine. 
because the vaccine didn't do it. You did it. Don't come out until I tell you, you can come out. And so what we're looking at right now is the return of the black cosmic mother, because we're going into the age of Aquarius, according to what they say, but the age of Aquarius is the black cosmic mother who is the water bearer of life. And the earth is cleansing itself of all of its problems. And before you can get better, before you heal, you have to have an operation. It's not something we all want to go through, but if you want to get better, you got to have the operation in order to get better. And this is what nature is telling us right now. And it, it's hard for me to perceive what I see some folk that's supposed to be so intelligent. It's hard for me to understand what they're talking about because they're talking nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because the answer is very clear to us, what needs to be done. And as I watch black folk, wherever I may go, Black folk are doing the right thing. And if you really want to understand what you need to do, just look at the black woman and follow what mama says. Because she's been around long enough and given birth to enough of us to know what it is that we have to do. And when Dr. Sheikh Anta Job talks about this concept of culture, we have to look at the world through our own culture. He says that when someone wants to oppress another people, this has nothing to do with culture. This just has to do with one person wanting to oppress another. There are three things they take from them. They take their history, they take their language, mm -hmm. and they take their psychological factor, which mm -hmm. Dr. Leonard Jeffries says, your psychological factor are your VIPs, your values, your interests, and your principles. Mm -hmm. And after they take your history, your language, your values, interests, and principles, they then superimpose by any means necessary their history, their language, their values, interests, and principles. And they can walk away at that point because no matter what decision you may come to, it'll never be in your best interest because you're not looking at the world through your history, your language, your values, interests, and principles. And so what we have to do is understand the role that culture plays and that in hip hop is culture. I'm doing work now on the relationship between the click language mm -hmm. of Southern Africa, the first mm -hmm. language with the beats of hip hop. Oh. Now I may, look, the curse words, the misogyny, all that, okay, okay, we all gotta work on that. But what the young people keep telling us, it's not the words. See, we come from a Smokey Robinson generation. We come from a poet laureate generation where words mattered in music. But right now in hip hop, it's the beats. Right. And the awesome. beats of hip hop can be compared to the piano playing of Thelonious Monk that can be compared to the click language because the way Thelonious Monk played the piano is very much like the click language because the click language really is in language arts See, this is why we got to look at this, my sister, and to my family that's watching this from our own eyes and stop listening to these people because these people don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And also, also uh, the tap dancer. It's exactly. It's all that. It's clicks. It's mm -hmm. beats. That's what we, that's our African funk. Mm -hmm. That's African funk. That's James Brown, Fela Ransom Kuti. That's Miriam Makiba. All of it. Okay, that's what you're dealing with. But if you're on a different wavelength, if you're looking through someone else's history, language, values, interests, and principles, and not your own, you can't see this connection. And if you can't see the connection, you're not going to solve your situations. Once we break out of this, we're going to leave them in the dust. That's why they keep trying to hold us back. Right, because they know. They know that once we, look, look at Simone Biles. Okay, Simone Biles. Now here's what they got the nerve to tell Simone. And this, what they tell Simone Biles is what they tell all of us in every phase of life. Mm -hmm. Simone Biles is beyond her game when it comes to gymnastics. She's doing things in, in gymnastics that ain't nobody ever thought about. And then what do they say? They say, well, you can't do that. Well, well, why can't I do that? Well, because we can't do that. Mm -hmm. exactly. And if we can't do that, you can't do that because then where will we be 
in competing with you will never win again. That's why they didn't want Jackie Robinson to play baseball because they knew Hank Aaron was coming. Mm -hmm. That's why they didn't want us playing basketball because they knew that we would have players that would come and change the game. And they did because black folk got so good, they had to raise the hoop up. Black folk got so tall, they had to raise the hoop up. Black folk got so good, the two shot got so easy, they had to create a three shot. That's what it is in throughout all the sports. But family, if we do that in, this, in the classroom, we'll, do, we'll leave them behind in the classroom too, because this excellence is applied to everything. And please, let me just say this also. Yes, as African people, we are very great. We have, a, we, we have achieved the very first of many things. But here in America, we're not great just because we're African. I wouldn't want to tell a child that. I would not want a child or a person to think you are superior simply because you are an African. Because that's not accurate. I believe Dr. King was right. It is the content of your character that you should be measured by. What makes African Americans so great is despite and in spite of everything they did to us, still we rise. Still we can produce our Simone Biles. And if you wanna drop it, we can create our Tiger Woods. I don't get into the personal aspect of it, but the brother got game. His okay. image alone brought more black folk into an understanding of that game. His contributions cannot be denied. I may have personal issue, but that has nothing to do with his game. And I try to stay away from blending the two. You got game, but there's challenges here. And I understand that. Tiger Woods changed the game of golf. He did in, in 2019 what Muhammad Ali did when he came back and won the heavyweight championship again when he got that, that green jacket. Again, after 10 years being off the scene and being hounded. Mm -hmm. Talk about buck breaking. When they made him stand before that microphone and apologize for all he did, when the people that had him come up and do that, they were doing worse than him. That was buck breaking. They wanted black folk to see that black man down on his knees apologizing for things that he did. Right or wrong, good or bad, I'm not going to go there. I'm talking buck breaking right now. And what they do to black folk when they start to rise and they become, that's why they did that to Muhammad Ali. They were trying to buck break him. But Ali showed him, you ain't buck breaking me. He gave up three years of his most productive boxing career. Yes. And still came back and won it twice again. Yes. But you know, the thing that I admire about him, and we're going to get back to the book, um, although these concepts are all- it's All uh, related, my all sister. All related. <laughs> all related. He, some people said he was ego tripping, but he was just reinforcing that cosmic law inside himself. That's it. Whenever he talked about, I am the greatest, yes, we all should be saying that when we look in the mirror in the morning. That's right. That's and, right. And act accordingly and let, let that become our natural way. That's it. That, that is it. And you see, your being the greatest isn't in competition with other people. Your being the greatest is who you were yesterday. You're greater today. And you pray to be greater tomorrow than you are today. The greatest isn't between people. And we have to understand that. But you see, when you're dealing in this Western civilization, you are based off of each other. Even in schools, when you take a test or when you do work, what do you do? You always put the highest grade on top mm -hmm. and then you go down to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So there's always a competition between people because when you make people compete with themselves, the real people that are getting the advantage ain't touched. Right. We're too busy fighting amongst ourselves on the lower level. And that plagues our communities. And that is what is the seething forces in spirituality before religions. Set. Set is the destroyer. Set is the destroyer. He is the desert. Mm -hmm. He is the earth when it is not pleasant. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, set sometimes is necessary. See, this 
here's the other thing about the way in which they created the story. There, to, to the African framework and spirituality before religions, one of the things that I try to get to is to understand that there is not, no such thing as good and bad. There is good and then what exists when it's not good. Because that always leads you back to being able to get back to good again. Because sometimes your greatest lessons of good is learned in the bad. So True. sometimes the bad is necessary, just like you have the, the righteous path of Ma'at, you have the path of Ishfet. Ishfet is not the road that you want to be on. It's Ma'at. But sometimes to find Ma'at, you must be on Ishfet. You have to be in the darkness to be able to really respect the light. How do you know what is good if you don't know what's bad? Yeah. So our ancestors gave us this play, this balance of life that's absolutely beautiful. And they, they gave us these neteru or these essences, the characteristics of the cosmos. Fatherhood, motherhood, the oracle reader gave us air, water, or moisture, gave us the sky and the earth. Now, of course, Western civilization will tell you that Africans worship rocks. And no, Africans did not worship rocks. And Europeans all kind of manner worship of rocks. pagan things. Exactly. But see, pagan came from the Romans. The word itself. We didn't, we did not. We understood that these, that when you looked at the cat, okay, when you looked at Bastet, or when you looked at the Sphinx, you were looking at God's gift of agility. When you looked at the bird, Heru or Tehuti, you were looking at the power of sight. Mm -hmm. When you looked at a rabbit or a hare, you were looking at consciousness because their ears are so big. When you, when, when you looked at the different animals of the world, they represented the gift that the creator gave to that animal. So when you see a bird's head on top of a human body, they weren't worshiping the bird. They were worshiping the God-given gift of insight that the bird had and hoped that they would have it. When you look at the letter M in Medunetair or hieroglyphics, you look at the owl. But why would they pick the owl? Well, one of the reasons why they could have picked the owl is because the owl is able to see in the dark, which means that you can see intelligence and ignorance. You can see the right in the not so right. But an owl can also turn its head around 359.9 degrees, which means that it can see all angles of things. And so they saw the owl as being wise. Even now, remember the potato chips, wise potato chips? Yeah. Remember in graduations, the owl represents graduations. You always have the owl representing graduation. Well, that comes deep from within an African consciousness that because the owl can see in the dark, the owl can see brilliance in darkness and it can see all angles of things, which means that you have a holistic view of the world around you. We didn't worship the owl. We worshiped the God-given gift that the owl had that we hoped we could have. Messages are everywhere and they're put there for our evolution, for our involution. They're put there in the owl. They're put there in how uh, the flora and the fauna relate to one another. They're put there in the beats, everywhere. Everywhere. And we they just were, have to connect to it. That's it, and that's our job. And that's and our they, job. They existed before the beginning began. Mm. Nature set the table and put the food out before we came in to sit down to eat. Everything we needed was already here. Gosh. All we had to do was fulfill the creator's dream. She, he wanted us to know that we were the creator having a human experience. And the creator would live through us mm -hmm. that acknowledgement, that mm -hmm. approval, mm -hmm. and that acceptance. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the simplest things are the most powerful. So I was talking to a sister about this book uh, recently and she called it 
the common denominator by which all life is divisible. Do you agree? Absolutely. And what about this book is for every reader? Every reader. I, I, I wrote it as an educator. I said, what, who is my audience? Who do I want to write this book to? I didn't write it for college, although college students can read it, but I did not write it with a collegiate mindset. I wasn't trying to impress people. I just wanted to tell a story. Yes. I, I, I wanted to tell our story. And the common denominator is a thread. And what I did is I used a sixth grade vocabulary. Simple well, we and, and, and very um, uh, simple, not complex sentences. Every so often I might've gotten into a couple of commas and semicolons, but I dealt with a, a subject, verb, object. <laughs> Keep it plain. Keep it plain. Don't, don't, don't try to get cute with your words and don't, you know, just make it so that there's a flow. There's a flow. Well, it, this, this book is uh, a feature at uh, the Black Book Expo, uh, this Conscious Literary Festival, Spirituality Before Religions. Spirituality is unseen science and science as seen spirituality, the science that codifies for some things that need, need words and physical explanation. Professor Kamine, it is always a pleasure. Every time we speak, I learn something and I'm grateful for it. I'm sure that those who are with us here um, also are learning. I see Imani's asking a question. What other books do you recommend that that's on the same content as yours? Others that she can also, after, listen, after she collects this one, others that she can also collect? Uh, well, I can tell, uh, you said her name is Imani. Mm -hmm. well, 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 Imani, if you get the book, I have an entire book list. Uh, I have two different types of book lists because as I told you, I never mentioned a religion in my book. But at the end of my book, Spirituality Before Religion, I have a collection of many of the books that were written in terms as it relates to the Africanness of the major religions, Christianity, uh, Hebrewism, um, and uh, Islam, Buddhism. I, I have an entire list. The other thing is that you can go to my website, kabakamene.com, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E.com. You can download my free e-course and my uh, free study guide, 44 pages that lists all of the books, all of the things. How do you study the origin of life in Africa? You know, I mean, I could give you a book to read, but how do you actually study it? How do you study it from physical anthropology to cosmology, uh, to physical evolution, to agriculture? How do you study it? Well, I laid it out in themes and I've even got the books listed that, and not just books, but chapters in books that pertain to that particular theme. The, the Africans in Europe, we talk about the Moors. I've got a whole curriculum on the Moors in my study guide. Africans in America, they blow people mind. I, I tell them, look, Africans were in America 100,000 years ago. There's evidence of Africans in San Diego, California, 90,000 years old, they found bones of a black woman. Mm. Cognitive dissonance, it shocks people. Yes. It shocks them. Yes. You talk, you talk I'm talking about African American, I'm talking about original African American history. I'm talking about a hundred thousand years ago. I'm saying to African people that in some of you, there are there is the blood of the original Twa Mbuti that was here. You not only have the, the bloodline of those that were stolen from Africa 400 years ago, you also have the bloodline of the original Africans that were here 100,000 years ago before the people we call Native Americans were here. Tell it. Come on, we're going to have to drop this. I talk about Africans in Asia. Got a curriculum on the Africans in Asia. Who was the first Shotokan? Who was the first Samurai? 
Why is there a Japanese proverb that says, to be a true samurai, you must have a bit of black blood? Who are we as a people? And what have we achieved? And spirituality before religions is meant to go inside. We're, we have evolved. Ain't nothing gonna change on the evolution stage. But we have to involve now. We have to go back from whence we came. We have to go back before the beginning began to figure out who am I, Imani? Who am I, Omilade? Who am I, Kaaba? Who am I? And why am I here? What's my divine purpose? Because I know that my purpose in school is not to pass a test. My, my, my purpose in, in class is to become conscious. And this classroom ain't making me conscious. <laughs> In fact, I'm losing my conscience in this classroom. Right. Maybe I need to step out. I have never met a high school dropout. I've only met high school pushouts. We got to save ourselves because ain't nobody else going to do it. And we got to educate our own children. We have to create our own curriculums. We have to continue the Alegba folklore. We have to continue these types of programs where we can share this type of information. So my sister, I, I just thank you, my sister Omilade, for giving me this opportunity to speak to the community on this very important level. I don't write books because I'm a writer. I write books because I got something to say. And, and we have to understand that we are the creator having a human experience and how we treat each other is how we, cre how we treat the creator. How we treat the least of these is how we treat the creator. You cannot hurt the earth, the air, the water and say you love God. Because you just destroyed God. You just polluted God. So how are you going to love God? And how can you believe in something you can't see when nature you can see? And that is God on earth. Indeed. Nature will answer the question. Indeed. I know that our viewers join me in saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish we had more time to keep going. But will you come back another time? I will be back. I will look forward to it. I look forward to it. And I thank you, my sister. And to all of our people, this is our time now. There is a return of the Black Cosmic Mother. That's the last chapter in spirituality before religions. I demonstrate to you what I mean when I say, I'm not just talking, I'm talking science. There is a return of the Black Cosmic Mother. We are moving into another age. You can see what is happening all around us. We must get ready for the changes. All power to the people. Have to get ready. All power Thank to the people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, maybe that's what we'll talk about next time. Steps for getting ready. Because we have to reprogram our thinking. Well, you know, this is one of them right here. We are doing it as we speak. And even though we see things in a challenging way, what I tell the children, what I tell everybody is, we are going to get through this. And we are going to get to the promised land. Mm -hmm. Dr. King was right. We do have difficult days ahead. But we are going to get, as a people, we're going to get to the promised land. Don't ever forget that. No matter what you see happening out here, this politics of fear to get you scared and fearful. Yeah, it's there. But we're going to get over this. And we are going to get to the promised land. Just know that and leave each day knowing that you are in the process of becoming. Mm. The question is, what are we doing? We just got to keep on keeping on. Indeed. And, and on that note of optimism and certainty, we thank you again for closing us out on the Arthur Chats of the Black Book Expo a conscious literary festival from Dr. Malefi Kete Asante to Dr. Ronald Crutcher to Anthony T. Browder and Atlantis Browder to Chief Oluwo Obafemi Fayemi to Her Majesty Queen Mother Dewoti Desir to Professor Kaba Kabine. The Alegba Folklore Society is grateful to you all for bringing us knowledge and wisdom and literature that we can collect and have in our homes. Um, the Black Book Expo is uh, culminating 
this weekend. For those of you who are near Richmond, please come on into the Cultural Center. Um, again, we are getting the online store all set up. So you can go there on our website and uh, find the books that, that are uh, uh, calling your interest so that we can pack them up all so nicely and send them down to you so that we can stay connected wherever we are, we can stay connected. We will be live streaming on Saturday and Sunday. Um, the event starts at three o'clock, the live stream starts at four o'clock each day. So there'll be independent authors here in the cultural center that you'll be able to interact with as well. Uh, it's a conscious literary festival and consciousness is a part of that cosmic law. And so as we uh, leave each other right now, we know that we stay together as it has been declared in the unseen. Thank you again, everybody, so very much. And until the next time, have a beautiful evening. <laughs>